Hello and welcome to the third episode of the monthly roundup from Kepler Trust Intelligence. My colleague Ryan and I will be taking a whistle-stop tour through all the news and reviews in the investment trust world over the month of July. So Ryan's going to start proceedings with the news and the private equity sector in particular. Yes, that's right, Joe. We do indeed start off with some news from the world of private equity and in particular a trust called HG Capital. HG has announced a sale of its holding in an Italian software business called Team System, which we think makes for quite an interesting data point and also a good read on the health of the wider private equity sector. Now, for a bit of context, Team System was first purchased by HG in 2010, and a stake was sold in late 2023 as a significant uplift to the purchase price. Fast forward a few months, and the company has now fully exited the position earlier in July of this year. What's notable about this is that the disposal has come at a higher valuation than it was in the most recent NAV of March 2024. Now, this comes at a time when many commentators have raised really serious questions over the carrying values of private equity holdings, especially in light of the volatility we've seen in wider equity markets as a result of the higher interest rate environment. Even the Bank of England has made some public comments concerning valuations, which has added to a broader scepticism about whether the listed NAVs of some private equity trusts were accurately reflecting the values of their holdings. This sentiment is arguably being reflected in the discounts we see across private equity trusts. Many of these are trading at significant discounts to NAV, with a sector average of around 22%. Though it's worth noting that HG is an exception to this by trading at a small premium. What has contributed to this has been the lack of private equity exits because of uncertainty in the wider markets we previously mentioned. However, the team system sale is the third deal that HG Capital has done in 2024, and all of these have been done at a level above their, what they were listed at in the NAV. Therefore, not only is this news another win for shareholders of HG, but these transactions have been a really good test for private equity valuations and a demonstration that the values in the NAV seen across the sector may be more accurate than they're being given credit for, and that some of the concerns could be overdone. If this is true, the discounts that we see elsewhere in the sector could arguably be a little wide in places. Furthermore, this could be taken as a sign that capital markets are beginning to move again, which would have positive implications not only across the private equity space, but for the potential of the IPO market too. And this would have consequences across the wider market. Thanks for that. And sticking with private equity, we also saw the announcement of the sale of Graphcore, which has implications for a couple of investment trusts. So could you give us the highlights? Yeah, of course. Um, again, we'll go into a little bit of background. Graphcore is a British semiconductor company that has been through a bit of a roller coaster in the past few years. It achieved the rare feat of being a so-called unicorn, having achieved a valuation of over a billion dollars back in 2018. Um, it got as high as $2.5 billion in 2020 um, and had investors from the likes of Microsoft, Samsung, Dell. So well-supported, interesting company. Um, the firm itself designs chips with a particular focus on AI, but has really struggled to sort of gain sales traction against the likes of NVIDIA. Um, the firm was loss-making and was struggling to turn that around. In July this year, the firm was eventually bought by Japan's SoftBank sort of for a reported figure of around sort of 500 to 700 million dollars. Now, this is down on its peak value, and it's actually disappointingly below the total of money that the company has raised. But two trusts that owned it, Chrysalis and Schroeder British Opportunities, have actually got some positives to take from it. For Chrysalis, the trust. Uh, had already written down the investment to a carrying value of around £35 million. Therefore, the sale is actually a positive. It's a 25% uplift to its carrying nav, um, though the full round trip of this transaction is actually a small loss. However, it does free up capital for the trust. It can be used elsewhere. SBO, uh, Schroeder British Opportunities, has done a little bit better. It's broken even across the full length of its investment, um, but over the short term has benefited as well. The managers, again, have been very prudent in writing down the value of the company and its NAV as it was struggling. And then this sale represented 22% gain on the most recent NAV. This will have a positive impact overall of just under 1%, but it just goes to show that these deals are, are being done. The overall figures aren't quite as positive as we've seen in the likes of HG Capital, but considering the challenges Graphcore was facing and the fact that valuation has been written down by both trusts in advance should be taken as a positive. 
both managers had reflected weaker trading conditions in their NAV. And the fact that a takeout has come at a valuation higher than this and therefore creating a boost in the NAV of both these trusts is another demonstration that these carrying values are fairly representative, if not a little bit conservative. We believe this again shows that there could be valuation opportunities in the private equity and adjacent sectors, such as the growth capital sector that both Chrysalis and SBO sit under. Both trusts themselves are trading at wide discounts to NAV, and therefore this could represent an opportunity for investors. And our final piece of news is in the US small cap market. So Ryan, could you tell us what's been happening there? Yes, the month of July saw some big moves in the Russell 2000 index, which is the US's predominantly small cap market. Just before the middle of the month, the index had a really strong rally, including one of its best ever one day gains on record. Now, as of the time of recording, markets have um, seen a bit of a sharp sell off. Though the Russell index remains substantially up over the month of July in comparison to the S&P, which is the US's large cap index, which is broadly flat over the same period. The reason for this climb has been driven by increased optimism of a rate cut following encouraging inflation data, though questions over the valuations of large cap tech following a very strong run of their own have contributed to the relative performance versus large caps. What we believe this shows is that there is appetite for smaller companies when conditions look better. The performance we've seen has been quite short term and shouldn't be a guide to future returns, as we often say. But considering the struggles that smaller companies have endured, seeing such a sharp rally is quite encouraging for the potential of a recovery should macro conditions continue to improve. One trust that would be well-placed to take advantage of this is Brown Advisory US Smaller Companies, which we're going to talk about later in our event roundup piece. Thanks, Ryan, for that very neat segue, because it is time to move on to the event roundup. After the success of our first Small Cap event, we held a second webinar series, which we creatively called Small Caps Encore. If you didn't manage to catch the webinars, all the recordings are available on the KTI website. So, Ryan, could you start us off with an overview of some of the interesting themes from the first two webinars, which looked at investing in the UK and Asian small caps? Yes, I can. Uh, we'll start off with Asia. We had a presentation from Gabriel Sachs of Aberdeen Asia Focus, AAS. Uh, smaller companies in Asia have bucked the trends globally by actually outperforming their larger cap peers and have done pretty much every single year for the last 20 years, with the exception of one or two, notably 2021. Despite this, Gabriel believes that the asset class is regularly overlooked by investors. And because of this, there are a lot of hidden gems for him and the team to find. And he can get they can gain considerable upside by identifying them and owning them as they're then recognized. To do this, they have the support of a very large, well-resourced team and a lot of experience within that team. He highlights that the reason to own this asset class includes a diversification benefit against wider Asian markets, as well as offering lower volatility versus large caps when combined together. Not only has this led to Asian small caps outperforming their large cap peers, as we mentioned, but they've also outperformed many global markets more broadly since 2000, including the all-conquering uh, S&P. It hasn't worked quite as strongly in the short term, but since the beginning of this century, they've done very well. Now, much of this has come down to the structural tailwinds that the region is benefiting from, such as the expanding middle classes, as workers are moving up that wealth ladder and increasing their levels of consumption accordingly. One example of this Gabriel pointed to is sort of local cosmetics firms, such as in China, where consumers are not only buying more as they're becoming wealthier, but they're also favouring local brands over the more expensive and well-established Western equivalents. However, he also pointed to the rapid expansion in consumers going forward, um, big expansion expected to the end of the decade across Asia, including India, um, as reasons to really be positive that this can continue quickly and sustainably going forward. Furthermore, Gabriel points to the region seeing benefits from an increase in capital expenditure from businesses in the region. He noted that this looks to be a particular benefit to the tech sector, which the semiconductor industry um, is benefiting also from a boost in the AI-driven demand. This is causing investment to come in and creating sort of a virtuous circle. We argue this could be a sign of improved confidence in the region um, from businesses, which certainly step in the right direction, especially in the light of negativity we've seen from markets towards the region, primarily focused on concerns over China. 
Now, despite all of these positives, Asian small caps are still chronically underowned by investors. Current allocations are at decade lows, despite the fact that they've outperformed their larger cap peers and offer all those diversification benefits. Valuations are not really the reason behind this. They remain attractive and in line with 10-year averages. And furthermore, AAS itself remains at a discount to NAV of around 16%, meaning investors can effectively pick up this well-performing asset class, offering diversification benefits at a potentially very attractive level. Absolutely. And now turning to the UK, can you talk us through what Robin West of Invesco Perpetual UK Smaller Companies discussed? Yes, of course. Turning closer to home and to one of our most talked about topics, certainly in the office and in some of our pieces, UK Smaller Companies. Robin shared a very upbeat message for the domestic outlook for the sector. The asset class has been under pressure since pretty much 2016, uh, with political turmoil leading um, investor sentiment, both internationally and domestic, who just turned their backs on the country and didn't want to know. And this particularly affected smaller companies who were more domestically focused rather than the multinational peers you get in uh, the larger cap indices. However, these ties do seem to be turning. We have a new government, which I'm sure hasn't escaped the attention of well, anyone really. Um, and they are yeah. talking themselves as sort of centrist and growth focused. Um, as such, the UK, according to Robin, looks relatively stable now, something we haven't been able to say for a while. And this is really encouraging for the outlook for the country. Now, as such, Robin says that global managers are becoming much more positive on the UK, and this is really encouraging for markets. Furthermore, we have potential interest rates coming around the corner, which would make equities as an asset class look considerably more attractive relative to cash. And in the meantime, Robinson points to the UK being cheap, best demonstrated by the plethora of M&A activity we've seen in the past couple of years. To put some numbers on the potential for valuations, Robin pointed to uh, what we call trailing PE numbers, which is price to equity. Um, the ratio is currently about 11, 11 and a half times. Now, when we've met these levels before, uh, the following year returns have been around 22% over 12 months and then 42% over 24 months as a small cap market enjoys not just a bounce of markets coming back, but also a bit of a, a FOMO, a fear of missing out effect as investors go, oh, small companies have done well and then come back in again after, after another year. So, some good long-term returns to be had potentially if we see a turnaround. Now, IPU, again, is trading at a discount, as we expect, from most of the sector, uh, currently around 15%, despite all the sort of positivity that could be around the corner. The trust traded at a small premium um, as recently as late 2019. This was a period where international investors became much more positive on the UK prior to, to COVID, it was after sort of a Brexit announcement. Then it slipped back to a, a discount again, during that weakness. So there is precedent for it to uh, trade at a much better rating, but we obviously caution that past performance is no guarantee of future returns. Now, furthermore, Robin also highlighted the trust enhanced dividend policy that pays close to 4% a year. And this comes from a combination of the underlying revenue and a small contribution for capital. Now, this should enhance the trust appeal to a wider pool of potential investors, as not only can they get the potential capital benefits of smaller companies, but also get a nice income coming from it as well. So this broader appeal has certainly helped with the net keeper discount narrow over the longer term. Discount is currently quite wide to the sentiments, but we believe that this really has the potential to close right in. Now, Joe, uh, turning the tables back to you, yeah. we also heard from Chris Berrier of Brown Advisory US Smaller Companies at the event. We briefly touched on US smaller companies' performance in the news section. So what did he have to say about the asset class in particular? Yes, Christopher picked out two main features of the US small cap sector, which he sees as creating attractive opportunities for a stock picker such as BASC. Firstly, it's a vast universe. There's more than 2,000 US small caps, but it's also a dynamic universe. So there's IPOs feeding it, and there's also M&A activity. So he sees that as a regular refreshing of potential investment opportunities. Now, we've talked about this before, but we'll touch on it again. The average number of analysts that cover US small caps is five. Um, that's compared to 19 for large caps and as many as 40 or 50 for the Magnificent Seven. 
And notably, 8% of small caps have no analyst coverage at all compared to zero for large caps. So as you mentioned, um, unearthing hidden gems earlier, again, this lack of research coverage can help with that. Secondly, over half of the capital in the US small cap sector is now passively managed compared to around 10 to 15% um, a decade ago. And this flow of capital hasn't been based on fundamentals, it hasn't been based on valuations, and that can cause mispricing both on the upside and the downside. As we know, small caps have underperformed in eight of the last 10 years, but US small caps have outperformed over the longer term. And as Chris mentioned, the law of large numbers means it's actually easier to grow from a smaller revenue base. So if investors are willing to stomach potentially higher volatility along the way, US small caps do offer the potential for higher gains over the longer term. I think Chris feels small cap valuations are not absurdly cheap. Uh, You talked about UK valuations uh, a couple of minutes ago, but they are trading below historic norms. And as with UK small caps, the question is, what's the catalyst that's going to prompt this re-rating? And Chris spoke about recent performance being unusually narrow, as we know, and you only have to look at the year-to-date gains in NVIDIA to see that. So at the moment, most investors own the same stocks. But he was saying at some point, conditions will change. This level of concentration is likely to end. If that happens, capital will start to flow elsewhere. And as Chris put it, this large cap pain could lead to small cap gain. A very neat summary there. Thank you, Joe. Um, You also sat down with Olivia Markham, who is the co-manager of the BlackRock World Mining Trust, um, to discuss the commodity sector bit different to what we have spoken about before. So could you perhaps run us through the highlights of your conversation? Yes. I think there's four really interesting themes that Olivia discussed, which highlight the investment opportunity in the commodity sector. The first one is copper. So um, BlackRock World Mining is overweight copper. The managers like the long-term structural growth story. Um, On the demand side, it's a critical metal for the transition to net zero, which we've written about at Kepler particularly in terms of the distribution of electricity that's going to underpin that move to renewable energy and also the data centres that will support AI. Turning to the supply side, there's been a decade of structural underinvestment in copper mining, and that's led to tight supply, which should support copper prices over the longer term, I think particularly given the time it takes for mining assets to come on stream. Secondly, It's interesting to think about diversification within the asset class. You know, we often look at commodities as a single class, but actually it's composed of many different commodities and they have different growth drivers. So if we start with gold, that's performed incredibly well. As Olivia spoke about, it's up more than 20 percent in the past year. It's recently hit its all time high once again. And classic drivers of the gold price aren't really there this year. So it doesn't particularly typically perform well when the dollar is fairly strong or when interest rates are high. But the movement this year has been more a function of central bank purchases, particularly in China, um, continued geopolitical risk, and also that balance of inflation versus rate cuts. However, if we look at silver, for example, it straddles both in terms of industrial and other drivers. So similar drivers to gold, it typically trades at a ratio to gold, but it also has a very important role in the energy transition, and that's largely linked to solar energy. So Quite different drivers, but still strong strong price performance for silver. It's up around 14% in the last year. So moving on to another topic, Olivia talked about the clear disconnect of valuations of precious metals equities versus historic averages. We've seen deratings of these multiples. And she was talking about once these companies can really prove that they can translate higher gold prices into higher cash flows, she sees a valuation opportunity for these equities to re-rate and also some upside in terms of current valuations of copper equities. But you touched on China earlier. You know, macroeconomic sentiment to China has weighed on commodity valuations. They are a key consumer of commodities, as we know. But Olivia was speaking about growth may be lower, but it's from a large base. So absolute demand should still be healthy, even taking that into account. Finally, there's been a disconnect in the cost of building new capacity versus the price that equities or companies are valued at today. So that buy versus build argument has been driving M&A in the commodity sector. This structural lack of investment has left more limited pipelines. So companies are looking for quick fixes, particularly in terms of buying assets. 
So I think to conclude on that chat, some interesting structural growth drivers in commodities. Um, BlackRock World Mining provides diversified exposure to the metals and mining sector. But if you want to find out more, um, please head over to the KTI website where you can listen to that podcast in its entirety. So that's it for this month's podcast on Investment Trust News from July. We hope you join us again soon. And as before, if you have any suggestions for content you'd like us to cover, please drop me an email at joe at keplerpartners.com. In the meantime, there's more information on the topics we covered today on the Kepler Trust Intelligence website. And Ryan, thanks again for joining us. Thank you. Past performance is not a reliable indicator of future results. The value of investments can fall as well as rise, and you may get back less than you invested when you decide to sell your investments. It is strongly recommended that if you are a private investor, independent financial advice should be taken before making any investment or financial decision. Please be aware that there can be a time lag when we release podcasts, meaning time-sensitive information may no longer be accurate at the time of publication. Kepler Partners LLP has a relationship with some of the companies covered in this podcast, which may impair its objectivity. Kepler Partners LLP is authorised and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority.